13. Revelation chapter 13. We should like play when the saints go marching in. Steve, get out of here. Nash, go on. You guys, you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. And we'll all sing loudly, Lord, I want to be in that number. Because <laughs> they get candy back there. One of these days, I'm bringing Snickers bars. And I'm going to hand them out. And you guys are going to run into the kids' church at the end of the service and hold them up. Like, look what we got. The way they do to us every single week. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. Why did they get the cool guy to, to lead uh, the service back there? Uh, I'm sorry, folks. Your guy lacks imagination and preparation like that other guy. Anyway, good to see you. I'm looking forward to being in the message uh, here today. By the way, good to have you back, Charlie. Charlie was gone all last week. Uh, if you don't know where he went, make sure to ask him. <laughs> and uh, ask him details because people are asking me details and I don't know the answers. For instance, this last week, uh, somebody, several people said to me, Pastor, is, is Charlie proposing? Is, I think he's going to propose on this trip, isn't he? And when he was up in Atlanta. And I said, I don't know. And so I need to know the answer to that question. So you ask him and you tell me what he says. And then also um, just anything else that you find out. If you let me know as well. So make sure Charlie is right here. If you don't know him, if you're a guest today, you know who Charlie is. Ask him what he was doing, who he is visiting, and uh, details. So uh, all those things. One of the things about Charlie that just cracks me up is that he'll answer any question truthfully. Now, I, now I, some, I like if you ask me some questions, I'd say, well, you know, well, that question just crossed the line. I'm not answering. It's not really any of your business. But Charlie won't do that. He'll actually answer your question. And so go ahead and ask him hard questions. Enjoy uh, yourself. Charlie, good to have you back. Uh, glad to see you. We missed you a great deal. We were wondering whether or not you were late to service <coughs> Wednesday evening. Did you make it on time to the church you went to? All the local areas. Churches that canceled. Well, they all canceled church? So you didn't even go to church Wednesday night. You skipped church. I mean, I went online for stuff, but I nobody was nobody locally... Having any well, we were we were all taking bets on it, so uh, that was one of the options. So, well, see me afterward. And I'm kidding. We don't can't take bets on Charlie's church attendance, but <laughs> all right. If you're visiting with us, yeah, we're nuts. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. A pastor friend used to always say, and I, I think he's pretty right about this. He said, either everybody's normal. Or no one is. And I think that's pretty well, uh, the, the pretty good description. Are you in chapter 13 of Revelation? All right, let's begin reading our text. This morning we're going to read down to verse 8. This is John speaking again, giving him the testimony of what he saw. He said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven, horns and ten, seven heads and ten horns, and having upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast." And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life or the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We should read verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word. Thank you for the promise that goes with this portion of the Scripture that we're in. That, God, that there is a blessing for the individuals who read and who understand and who do the things that are written 
in this book of prophecy. And as we look at the future, knowing what the end is going to be for the wicked, may we see that even the days of triumph for the wicked, God, are they're limited and that they'll come to an end. And we just pray that we would very, very plainly see how we ought to respond based on what will happen in the future. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, they're singing good back there today, aren't they? <laughs> All right. If you could just try as well as you can to tune them out. Uh, they, it, it's the unfortunate reality that our facilities are what we have, and we're thankful for what we have. And so I, we just have to get used to some distractions. They are singing really well today. I, and I feel like we should sing back like Father Abraham or something. In here. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, I'm really glad to be in this portion of the Scripture, and I want to just bring us into where we're at, but we need to do just a little review, like if you haven't been with us as we've been preaching through the Revelation, it's kind of tough to come right in the middle of a series and uh, be in a place where there are just such dramatic events taking place, namely the dragon and this beast, which seem to have unharnessed, uh, not unharnessed, but unlimited ability to do evil, and unlimited ability ability to blaspheme God in heaven. Matter of fact, if all you were to read from Revelation is chapter 13 and really chapter uh, chapter 12, when we're introduced to the dragon, which is the serpent or the devil, we see in verse 9 of chapter 12, if you were to read all the way up until the time that the, that the beast and the dragon are actually bound in chains and put into the pit for a thousand years, it would seem as though evil triumphs. One of the problems with believers is that sometimes we have a very, very narrow view of God's ultimate plan. And it would seem, if you were to come into this portion of the Scripture, matter of fact, it seems as though a lot of people like to sensationalize or really emphasize Babylon and the wickedness of Babylon. And they like to emphasize the beast and the dragon as though that were the dramatic event of the revelation. And in truth, it is not. Uh, there's 42 months, which we know is a space of three and a half years that this dragon gets, uh, which is the devil and the beast, which is worshiping the dragon and causing people to worship the dragon. They have three and a half years that they're doing evil on the earth and that people are impressed with them and impressed with their, could, could we just call it audacity, to blaspheme God in heaven. Now I want to remind you about God in heaven and why it is that He allows blasphemy, why it is He allows wickedness. Would you just turn over with me to 2 Peter? I think every believer ought to be very familiar with 2 Peter chapter 3. I just want to read the, the, the whole chapter of 2 Peter because Peter really gives us a, um, a glimpse into the heart of God and His attitude toward those who are so wicked and so opposed to Him. Uh, Look at verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, Peter said, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Sort of like the, um, the clock winder theory where God is uninvolved. God, Yes, God made the world. Yes, we know there's a God, but where is He and what is He doing? He's not anywhere and He isn't going to do anything are the implications of what they're saying about God. And in verse 5, Peter said this, he said, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being flow, overflowed with water perished. Now, that isn't a complicated statement that Peter is making there. He's referring to the pre-flood time when the wickedness of men was great upon the earth and there was only one man, remember, uh, who feared God. That was Noah. And the Bible says the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In other words, one of the things that they're forgetting when they say God doesn't care, God isn't doing anything about the wicked, God isn't going to do anything about sin, they forget that God destroyed the world one time because of sin, with a flood. And so, first of all, this they willingly are ignorant of. And isn't that true today? Isn't it amazing today how you can go to the top of a mountain and you can find fossils of fish and sea creatures, 
fossilized on mountaintops. We were talking in the teen Sunday school this morning. Last year, no, two years ago, I, I was in Kansas in a little museum in Concordia, and one of the things that they were showing in the museum was uh, a fossil from a farm outside of town of a palm tree in the middle of Kansas. If you've ever been to Kansas, you know these things are not so to be. Uh, there shouldn't be palm trees in Kansas. Well, how did a palm tree get fossilized in Kansas? Well, there was a great flood. And any person who denies that is willingly ignorant of it. The fact is, you can go anywhere in the world, and you can today see damage done to the earth by a worldwide flood. You can go to the highest place on earth and see flood damage. That's incredible, but there are some people who deny the flood. And uh, that the Bible says they're willingly ignorant of. Well, the implications of the flood are are practical for us, aren't they? The fact that there was a flood shows that God is concerned about sin. God is not passive about sin. God has a limit when it comes to the wickedness of mankind. Hear me this morning. God has a limit when it comes to the wickedness of mankind. So why doesn't God do anything? Continuing in chapter 3 of Second Peter, the Bible says, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And that's a frightening statement, isn't it? Reality is God is storing and reserving the earth for judgment. It's going to be judged again. It's going to happen. God said, I'll never destroy the world again by flood. The next time God does it, it'll be by fire. And the fire with which the earth is going to be destroyed will be so intense that the elements will melt away with a fervent heat. Of course, you know, elements are basic things, right, that cannot be destroyed. We have elements of the periodic table, and they're basic to the point where you melt them down, they become that basic element. The fire's going to be so hot, they're going to burn up. That's incredible. That's judgment. Um, in verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, in a thousand years as one day. Again, it's not teaching the gap theory. Uh, the Scripture is simply saying God's very, very patient. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what things are going to be dissolved? The elements, the earth, going to be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And I'll leave that for you to read on your own time, Second Peter chapter 3. But every believer ought to be fully aware of the end of the wicked, of the end of a sin-cursed earth. My friend, this earth is even going to be Judge. This earth is being stored and reserved for final judgment at the hand of God. And so as we're in a portion, if you'll turn back to Revelation chapter 13, as we're in a portion of Revelation where we see those who would blaspheme being God, the dragon or the serpent, the devil, uh, or and those, the beast, who would uh, be given power by the serpent, to do blasphemous things. As we see uh, these grotesque, these dramatic events, and we see people following after and worshiping the beast and being impressed by his audacity and, and bowing before him because of how impressed they are by his wickedness, sometimes we tend to overestimate evil. Friend, don't do that. Don't make that mistake. See, again, remember, evil is being reserved. And the reason it's being reserved is because a merciful God in heaven, who's not slack concerning His promise, is long-suffering to us. And He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And is it not incredible that at such a time as this, when the influence of the Holy Spirit of God has been removed from the world, that staying influence that actually stops the devil, the serpent, from being as evil as he will be in the future times, isn't it incredible that in spite of all these things, God is able to seal 144,000 of Israel that have turned to Him in belief? Isn't it incredible that God is able to uh, have individuals that are called saints in this terrible time of great tribulation? By the way, did you notice that the thousand, three, uh, what is it, three score and ten days, the three and a half years and the 42 months, you notice that, what does that total up to time-wise? 
seven years. There are individuals today, tragically, that are so um, into coming up with new doctrine, new teaching, that they have a problem with the phrase seven years tribulation. And uh, it, it's unfortunate, actually, that in circles where individuals ought to be known for believing the Bible, that they can't just study the Scripture carefully and uh, simply understand that seven years, which is the 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation. But that's in our text today. It's not the, that's not the sense of what we're looking at. I just want to look at, uh, draw a couple of applications about evil and about the saints here today. Now, if you were with us last week, we were in chapter 12, and one of the things that we saw uh, was after we see the introduction of this serpent who tries to destroy the woman who is Israel, who flees into the wilderness, in verse 10 of chapter 12, and you can look at it, oh, we could see, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So we see that Satan no longer has access to accuse the brethren in heaven. Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And last week we really spent some time looking at, in particular, the, just this a small um, truth about the saints, uh, is just, is, which is just mentioned, but which has such powerful implications. We were reminded last week that the word for overcome is not the word, which it does not mean escape. A lot of times when we talk about overcoming, we think about escaping, don't we? We think about if a person overcomes an addiction, they, they escape the destruction, the destruction and the consequences of an addiction. We think of a person who overcomes a sin, uh, that they escape a sin. But overcomers are more than that. Overcomers, the word here is the word nikao, which means conqueror. I love the song, and I love the scripture, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And what a wonderful truth it is that as believers, we're not escapers, we're conquerors. And the mindset, the attitude here of these saints, look at verse 5 then, if you will, of chapter 13. And we think of the saints that are alive in the tribulation, both the 144,000, of course, we know the court of the Gentiles, uh, or the, the, the outer, outer court of the temple was for the Gentiles. We know they're Gentile believers in the tribulation time. In verse 6, or verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. In verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Then notice verse 7. And he was given unto him to make war with the saints. And what, is, what are the next two words? To overcome. To overcome, to overcome them. Now, I don't know about you, believer, but uh, I don't want to be overcome with evil. Matter of fact, as believers in the church, we're told not to be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a dark moment on this earth during this 42 months where evil overcomes good. That's never the case. The Bible says in Proverbs, I love some principles in Proverbs, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And I found many times that we tend to give the wicked a little more latitude or a little more benefit of the doubt about their effectiveness. My friend, wickedness has never triumphed. And wickedness will never triumph. I think some years ago, of course, you know, the area we live in is, is really known nationally to be a wicked place. You'd be surprised how many people from around the world, if you ask them where you live, and if you're, if you're from this area, we're in Fort Lauderdale, so we're, we're, the area surrounding us is Fort Lauderdale, but the actual city we're in right now is Oakland Park, and Oakland Park and Wilton Manors, and Wilton Manors in particular, are known uh, for being just perverted places, places where great perversion is. And... Um, it's fascinating to me how out in the open, especially the, this place is known, this area is known for overt perversion. But I've found uh, that oftentimes I've given more credibility to the wicked than they deserve. First of all, the percentages just aren't there. Um, you know, Wilton Manors has a 100% homosexual commission, and they have a homosexual mayor. And they're very, very intolerant of people that aren't sexually deviant in the police department or in the government. 
any of those areas. But you know that the homosexuals are a minority in Wilton Manors. I think I think it's now up to it might be thirty percent, but it used to be seventeen percent. It's known as a homosexual city, but seventy percent of the people that live there are not. And uh, you know, if you go uh, like to Taco Bell, I remember this some years ago, and I've told this story before. I remember a few years ago we were in Taco Bell, and there were a couple of people that were very, very uh, evidently perverted just from, from their appearance. And to, a couple of men were there. One man had a big chain around his neck with a great big padlock on it, which I think was really a sign of bondage. Ultimately, I saw it as a sign of bondage to sin. It was being very flamboyant, very uh, obnoxiously homosexual in, uh, in Taco Bell. And it's because it was a Sunday and several of us were there and we were wearing clothes where it was evident we probably had been to church. He was being in our face. And uh, I remember just thinking, you know what, I just want to get out of here. This is disgusting. I don't want to be in a place where this is going on, where this is happening. And then I remembered, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I thought, well, how's the righteous behave boldly? Well, you're not going to do like some obnoxious people and uh, just be obnoxious towards someone who's being obnoxious. I know people do that, but that's wicked. And that destroys the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you know what I did? I went up to the man that was being very flamboyant, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't know if anyone's told you this today, but God loves you very much, and Jesus loves you, and I want to be the person that tells you that Jesus loves you. And you know something? He didn't run, but he got out. He just got out. Now, the fact is, is that Jesus did love him. And the fact is, that's the message of the righteous. But it's incredible. He went from being in your face and wicked and, and uh, you know, the, the wicked owned this place was the attitude he was given off to there's a God. And you know something, it, it really just changed the entire atmosphere. Remember that man, was, he was just gone. He was out of there so quickly. And you know that's a message he needed. And you know the truth is Jesus does love him. Yeah. And I've seen God take individuals who are dead in the trespasses and sins, including us, and saving us and changing us. And that's the message of the believer. And that's the message for today. And friend, I have to tell you that it is not Jesus just throwing out words randomly and not knowing what He's saying when He talks about His church and the gates of hell not prevailing against it. Gates don't attack anything. Gates don't... You know, you never see gates storming an army. Storming a battering ram. Now what are gates for? Well, hell's gates are to be stormed by the church. And the church, my friend, is to be on the offensive. Not to be offensive in the sense that we are offended for our sakes. But the gospel, my friend, is a very, very offensive tool. And it is a very, very effective tool. And you know something? We wouldn't have the wickedness. We would not have the wickedness in our community if the gospel were being preached effectively as it ought to. And that ought to be a matter for great conviction to we who are responsible for preaching the gospel here. I think sometimes of the overwhelming responsibility. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit off topic here uh, right now, but this is important for us to consider. I think sometimes of the overwhelming responsibility that's given to every generation. You know, when years ago, not so many years, but uh, what was it, it's been 14 years ago that Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church was, no, not 14 years ago, 12 years ago that, our, that we planted our church here. And when we started our church, one of the things that I desired was to leave a ministry that would be a lighthouse for future generations. That, that's the way I would have phrased it. I would have said, you know what, I want our church to be established. I want to see people saved. I want to establish something lasting in, uh, for future generations. Some years ago, I watched a lot of churches that once seemed to be beacons for the gospel and seemed to effectively reach their community. And I watched them over the years change and even disappear and be gone. You know, it always bothered me a great deal. still bothers me. I don't like that. But you know something I realized? When Jesus gave the disciples, the apostles, the Great Commission, remember when He gave them, told them to wait at Jerusalem for the promise of the Father in Acts 1.8? He said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, both in Judea and Samaria, and uh, or in, in, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He did not say, You're going to be witnesses to a future generation. He said, You're going to be witnesses. And as we read... As we read the Acts of the Apostles, or really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, in establishing the church, we see the church have a worldwide reach and influence so that the, there was no place in the world that the gospel was not reached, was not preached. In one generation, we see that. And I'm reminded that it is not 
the past generation or the future generation which is supposed to preach the gospel to my generation. It's me. We ought to be burdened. We ought to be overcome by a burden continually asking ourselves the question, how will we, not who shall preach the gospel in this generation, how will we reach our generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Think on this. In a small community surrounding us, I know we're surrounded by millions of people. There are almost 2 million people in Broward County now. That, that's just mind-boggling how many people there are. Almost around 8 million people in the Tri-County area. And when I look at the numbers like that, I think that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. You know, on a daily basis, I meet people who have never once heard the gospel. Not once heard the gospel. Well, you know, we could break it down a little bit, couldn't we? Couldn't we say that in a city the size of Oakland Park where one of us could walk every street and knock on every door inside of a year, couldn't we say that our city ought to have least heard? Not a burden us. We ought to understand that we're to preach the gospel in our generation and we do so with great power. You know why this church house isn't packed out this morning? You know why we haven't had to move somewhere else and buy another place to meet at? You know why? Well, because we're not preaching the gospel as effectively as we ought to. The reality of it is that not everyone you preach to is going to hear it. But some will. And friend, when you take the numbers that we're surrounded by, some amounts to a lot. It ought to be a burden to us. We ought to be asking the question, if we say, you know, how many people have I won to Jesus? How many people have I reached for Jesus? And if the answer is only a few or none, we ought to be asking a self-diagnostic question saying, how does God want me to fulfill the Great Commission? For my generation. What is my place? What is my part in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? We ought to be burdened, we ought to be heartbroken over it. Because we ought to know that there's a time coming when evil is going to triumph. There's three and a half years during this tribulation period where literally the dragon is unleashed, the beast is unleashed, and they are wreaking havoc on the world. And now they've been given, at this point, they've been given the ability to blaspheme God blaspheme His name, verse 6, and His tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. You say, Pastor, what about blasphemers today? My friend, you've never seen blasphemy like this. Keep in mind the setting that John has painted for us through the, uh, by the Holy Spirit as he's recorded what he's seen. Keep in mind that the heavens have been rolled away like a scroll, and God Himself is sitting in the heavens. Now, it's one thing to realize that God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And when somebody says, I don't see God, like the guys on Sputnik did uh, when they first went into outer space. Or when somebody says, where's God? Well, God isn't visibly present here, but my friend, He's understood by the things that are, isn't He? You know, we know even the nature of creation, the Godhead. From Romans 1, Psalm 19, explain that to us, and we know the witness of that. We know there's a God because of what He put in our hearts. And these individuals who are worshiping the dragon and the beast as He's blaspheming are watching Him do so in the sight of visible God in heaven. There's the throne in heaven. And they can see it. This whole idea of the the disappearing rapture sort of a thing where we don't know what happened. You know, we think that individuals were abducted by aliens and that sort of nonsense. No, my friend, uh, when, the, when Jesus comes, the angel who described Jesus leaving said, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is going to come back and everyone's going to know who he is. And everyone's going to know uh, who the saints are when they go up. And they're going to know who God is. There's no mystery here about who is the true living God. And yet this dragon which has been unleashed, he's been unchained and he's allowed to have full reign on the earth. And he's able to be as wicked as he wants to be. He seems to be in a moment of triumph because he has the audacity to blaspheme God. Now let me remind you of a couple things if you're taking notes here. This is a dragon who's able to blaspheme God in heaven from earth. Do you hear me? In other words, he's been thrown out. He's been cast out. And he's not allowed to go and to accuse the brethren in heaven anymore. In other words, this is a limited access devil. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I get a thrill out of thinking that. I just think, how what a wonderful thing. This devil is so blasphemous, and he's kind of blaspheming like this. 
<laughs> you know, he can't get off the ground. Blasphemy. Uh, and that's a reality. That's the truth of it. You say, Pastor, you're making fun of the devils and, and Michael and the archangels wouldn't do it. No, I'm a conqueror, my friend. And through how? Through Him that loved us. Through Jesus Christ. I, I'm not an audacious individual. I'm not a person that says I'm ready to storm hell with a water pistol and that sort of nonsense. The fact of the matter... Oh, no, I did have my bubble gun on earlier, but I took it off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, storm hell with a bubble gun. Uh, the reality of it, though, is that I don't misunderestimate the devil. I understand. Uh, I understand how wily he is, how... Uh, how much my superior intellectually he is and how much we're children compared to him in tactics and so forth. But I also understand who my Jesus is. Amen. Hallelujah. And friend, this is a devil who is given full reign. He's given his last stand. And he's making it. And he is making a big show from earth. But he doesn't even get to go to heaven and accuse the brethren anymore. And his end is coming. You know, three and a half years is a terrible amount of time to be tormented by the Satan, isn't it? You think about that, that's a long time for this guy to be completely unleashed, uncontrolled. But even when he is out of control, he's still limited by an all-powerful God. My friend, can you think with me? Could you observe with me the logic of any individual shaking their fist at God? Any individual refusing to bow before God? Why is it that the Satan is allowed this moment? Well, it's explained to us by Peter in, in 2 Peter 3, isn't it? The heavens and earth that are now are being reserved. They're being kept in store, reserved <coughs> unto fire and judgment. Well, their day is coming. The day of the wicked, the destruction of the wicked, friend, is coming. I want to look at one last truth this morning as well. And it, it, it's, it's right here. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me, will you please? And pay careful attention to this phrase we're going to read in chapter 14 as well. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now before we make application, I go with me to chapter 14, the next chapter over in the Scripture. In verse 1 of chapter 14, John says, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as, as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but, an hundred, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Now we know from chapter 7 that this hundred and forty-four thousand were twelve thousand from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. Do we know that? Is the scripture plain about that? Uh, we know from Romans 11.26 when Paul talks about God's future plan with Israel, this is national Israel, which have turned to God in belief. When Paul said, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. These are the individuals, and this is the Deliverer from Sion. Notice this, verse 1 of chapter 14, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion. Do you guys know that's who is being talked about in, Re in Romans chapter 11 and verse 26? And by the way, that completely refutes the nonsense that's being spewed by individuals that try to say that God has no future plan for national Israel. Of course, Israel today as a nation is unbelief in unbelief. But my friend, there are individuals who are descendants of unbelieving Israel who are going to be sealed in belief. This 144,000 is clearly the nation of Israel. And so it's just utter nonsense that individuals would try to say, and you say, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you can see me privately, and I can share with you uh, some of the things that are being taught, but the Scripture absolutely refutes that foolishness. Now, in verses, um, in verse, I just want to get up to verse 12, and, um, and let's read verse 11. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever, and uh, they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image. 
And whosoever receiveth the mark of His name. Verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, what is our application here this morning? Well, the reality of it is, is that even in a time of great tribulation, when the dragon and the serpent are unleashed to do evil and to speak great blasphemies, and while individuals are bowing before the beast and the dragon, the Satan, and worshiping him in the presence of holy God, there are also those saints who are kept by God. And the Bible has a great promise for those same saints. Again, the, you see this in, in two places. In verse uh, 13 and verse 10, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Who is that? Are those believers or unbelievers? That's the Satan. That's the devil. In other words, evil, the, the judgment for evil is coming. You and I sometimes get so frustrated, but the thing that we're frustrated is at the long-suffering and patience of God. And friend, I for one am not one who stands in the place to be impatient with a patient God. Now first of all, the audacity of that is just wicked. But secondly, my friend, I benefit by God's long-suffering, don't you? Every time I think God ought to do something about that, I just think if God were to destroy the wicked, I'd be collateral damage. Wouldn't you? In other words, if God were to come in this room and deal with a hard hand with the wicked, how many of us would escape His judgment? Not a single one of us. Friend, I'm so thankful for long-suffering. You know, tribulation at the, at the hand of the devil, my friend... Hear this. This is our conclusion this morning. Tribulation at the hand of, of Satan is far more preferred by me than judgment at the hand of God. See, believers can undergo persecution, no question about it. Believers can suffer and even die physically for the sake of Christ. But friend, no believer will ever be in danger of hellfire and judgment. And no believer will ever face the hand of God. I had rather a thousand times go through anything the devil can levy against me. Listen to me. I'm afraid of the devil. You say, Pastor, you're afraid of the devil? Yes, I am. Mano a mano, me versus him. I'm afraid of that guy. With the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm an overcomer. I'm victorious. I'm a conqueror. But I am not afraid of the devil in comparison with my fear of God. And the saints are overcomers, friend. And it's a wonderful truth that we're being reminded about that even in a future day when evil triumphs like it never has before. Listen, could we say you ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to evil? It's just incredible. Sometimes I look at culture and I look at how shocking it is. And truly, uh, I'm only 40 years old. I know you all thought I was 100, but I'm really only 40 years old. And uh, you know, in my 40 years, I've seen a lot of change. You folks that are 41 and older, you've seen more change than I have. And it's a little surprising, isn't it? You ever look around and just think, man, I cannot believe. You know, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. It, has that ever been more true than today? You know, if you want to stand up against any kind of wickedness or sin or any kind of wrong thinking, what are you called? Well, the, the kindest word is bigot. You're called intolerant. The, the morality we have today is that anything evil is acceptable and good and profitable and a, a very good... But anything, any, but saying that evil is evil is the worst thing it could be. A person who believes that sin is sin, there's no tolerance in our society for it today, is there? Do you have any kind of morality to say good and evil. Did you guys hear about the, the Canadian Supreme Court ruling this, I don't know what the equivalent of the Supreme Court is, this uh, last month or so where they won't allow there to be a uh, Christian law school, like a, a law school can't exist because in their constitution, the law school wants to say that students cannot be in a moral relationship, uh, be in a physical relationship without being married. And so they're not allowed to exist as a college in Canada 
Because that is just terrible to tell a man and a woman that they have to be married in order to behave like married people with each other. That's, the, that's evil being called good and good being called evil, isn't it so? I mean, it's, it's, it's just so backward. And yet, <laughs> you could take my message today and you could just take it out just take it out on the streets in Oakland Park and read uh, what I just said, and people would say, you know, there's no more bigoted person in the, world, in the world alive than Pastor Price. I'm not bigoted. I love sinners. Uh, God loves sinners. I, I don't, I'm not against evil, but, but evil's evil and good's good, isn't it? That's right. And that's the day and age in which we live. The day is going to come when evil will seem to triumph more so than today. I, I, as, as I look at today and I look at how wicked things have turned, how morality has turned in my generation. Let me, let me just put it this way. This, this topic keeps coming up, but it, it's a good one because it's a, it's a prominent one in our society. Remember when President Obama ran for office and he was asked questions about marriage? Remember how adamant he was that marriage was only between a man and a woman? He ran on that platform. Marriage is between man and a woman. And you thought, well, at least that's one thing he's right about. Remember what he did? Remember what he says now? I mean, when he ran for office, if he'd said marriage is between a man and a man, he'd never been elected. But he went like this. And he tested the tides and the currents of change. And he saw where the education system had taken people to think. And he said, okay, I better turn directions or I'll get swept away with the tide. I'll get run over by the tide. So he just changed and went with the direction of it. I don't for the life of me think that former President Obama thinks that it's acceptable for a man and a woman to be married. You say, Pastor, he does, does. No, I don't. I just think that he's just trying to ride the tides of change. And he just had to get with the times. You ever watch on, um, you ever watch compilations of former presidents who were uh, very, very anti-immigrant, like Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton and uh, Hillary Clinton, and listen to what they said about immigration and how we have to have borders in order to have a nationally secure nation. And today, what do they say? The absolute opposite. In other words, I'm not trying to be political here, I'm just telling you whatever people believe, whatever people believe, morality changes, doesn't it? Right and wrong changes. What people believe changes. But when I read books that were written in the 19, early 1900s and the 1880s, some of the things that I see was that there were some more, there were more wicked things going on in our country, in our society, than are even happening today. And, you know, sometime uh, it'll do you good maybe to read some Roman history. Read about how things were in this century in which John was writing these letters. Now, I'll tell you something, America hasn't seen anything yet. Europe is nowhere near where it was at morally during the time of Rome. What I'm saying is wickedness is not new. Evil is not lately occurring. Righteousness is not a new thing. And I find there, first, great hope. Because what changes the days and the times is the preaching of the gospel. You know that that first century church that John was at the tail end of literally preached the gospel in such a way that the world actually was turned upside down? The nations of the Middle East and Asia and Europe and Africa, the known world at the time, were reached with the gospel. And it changed the world in that day. Friend, I have to say that the Holy Spirit of God today is not any more limited he has not limited Himself in any way. He is not less able to save to the uttermost all them that call upon Him, Jesus, than He was in any other day. What makes the difference in our times? Well, we have to not be overcome with evil. See, there's going to be a time here that we're going to see in the Revelation when the Holy Spirit of God is not going to be moving and working in the world. And the Satan is going to have full influence to do whatever he likes. And he's even going to be able to overcome good with evil. And that ought to cause you and I to sit up and say, we had better make hay while the sun shines. Don't you think? And we ought to look at this phrase about the saints that are able to overcome and say, you know something? God is so good 
that even in an age of blasphemy, even in an age of wickedness like the world has never yet seen, but we'll see during this time where the serpent and the beast are unleashed, even in these times, saints are able to survive. And they're able to have a testimony that they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. My friend, you and I, as we're in this portion of Revelation, are walk away, not impressed by the sensationalization of the beast and the dragon and how wicked they are and how blasphemous they are. Why well, I'd be impressed with a guy who, though he gives full reign to the serpent for three and a half years, is still completely in control. What a God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Do you know Him? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? How does one become a saint? Well, it's very simple. Very easy. See, one's a saint, a holy one, by being made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. No person's a saint because of what they've done. Matter of fact, because of what we've done, we're sinners. That's true, isn't it? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So how is it that a person becomes a saint? Well, simply by the reality that the only perfect person who ever walked on this earth lived a sinless life died for sin. Whose sin did Jesus die for? Well, not His own. He died for our sin. And the Bible says He was buried and He rose again the third day. And you know the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that may be a simplification of the Gospel message, but my friend, being a saint is simple. Receiving Him is simple. If you've never uh, received Jesus as your Savior, it's as simply as knowing that Jesus is God and He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and He rose again. And that just like in the wilderness when the children of Israel looked at the serpent, when they were bitten by a poisonous serpent, and they looked at the serpent and they were healed, you and I can look to Jesus and be saved from our sin. The Gospel is that simple. It's as simple as what I understood when I was a child. I remember praying a prayer, not these exact words, but something like this to God. I said, God, I know I'm a sinner. Is that true for all of us? God, I know that I deserve judgment. Is that true for all of us? Yes, it is. But God, I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did when He died on the cross for my sin. You know, God did. God saved me. His Spirit came in me. And I've had eternal life. And you can have the same. And my friend, once you become a saint, you certainly will overcome. Father, thank You so much for the message of the Scripture, for the truth of it. And Lord, I just ask that You would, in our hearts and our minds, increase the reality of eternity to us. The reality that You are a God who ultimately will judge all the living. The, the living and the dead, and that someday all of us will be brought before You. And God, help us to be found among those uh, that have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we just thank You so much for the simplicity of, of the Gospel. And God, I pray if there be a person that's in this room today that does not know Jesus as their Savior, that they would see how easy it is to bow and to call on the name of the Lord and to be saved. We know that would be Your desire and that would be what You'd want because You're long-suffering and merciful. God, I pray for our generation. Lord, it is so vital that we reach our generation with the Gospel. What goes on in this time when we have been taken away and when we're no longer on this earth, Lord, we can't do anything about it in that day. But we can do something about it in our day. And God, I pray that You would help us not to underestimate the power of the Gospel to save uh, those that call upon the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss this morning, uh, sometimes in our service, oftentimes we have an invitation where we'll sing a song and the pianist will play and we'll give people the opportunity to make decisions on the basis of what we've heard. If, if you need to make a decision like that today, you'll know that. And the way that you'll know it is that you'll, the Holy Spirit of God will have shown you. He'll have convicted you. And so maybe it would be something like this this morning. Maybe it would be uh, just the reality that you would be here and you'd say, you know, I'm not sure how things are going to end up as far as uh, me and God. I don't know what side I'm actually on. I want to be on God's side, but I don't have any confidence about that at all. I don't know that I have eternal life. My friend, that's not God's plan. God's plan is not for you to be confused about that or for you to be in the dark or to hope that you have eternal life. God's plan is for that to be settled and for you to know with confidence that you're born again. Being born again means that you've been born spiritually. 
born physically, but you have to have spiritual birth. And that's something that's a promise and it's a choice that you can make. And if that's something you need help with today, would you make sure, don't leave this place without saying, Pastor, uh, could, you, could you just help me to make sure that I know that I'm saved and that, I, that I'm on God's side, that I'm one of the saints. Uh, I'd be glad to help you with that. And then if the Holy Spirit of God's convicted you about anything else in particular, it could be something as simple as uh, the way that you're living or something that's going on in your life. Uh, but the Spirit of God knows what it is and you know what it is. And if He's given you conviction for it and He's talked to you about it, I haven't talked to you about it. I haven't spoke to you about, and spoken to you about anything particular in your life. And so if you're convicted about that, it's because God has. And so you respond to His voice, to His conviction. The way to respond to God is say, Yes, Lord, I agree with what you say. And yes, Lord, I'll do what you want in my life. And if you'll do that, my friend, you'll be in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. Uh, we're going to dismiss in just a second. And I want to ask uh, Charlie to dismiss us with a word of prayer while I go to the back so I don't uh, miss out on getting to shake anybody's hands. But thank you so much for being here today. It's a delight to have the opportunity to open the Word of God. And I look forward to being in Revelation the next several weeks and really unpacking some more of these events that are going to be in our future.